the enforcement committee meeting uh, of, what's the date today, the 16th? 16th, May 16th. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Joe Teckel. Present. John Vasquez. Here. Marie Gilmore. Here. Thank you. I'm checking to see if uh, these speaker slips I have are for public comment, but they all seem to be related to Okay, they're all related to agenda items. So we're gonna move on. So we have no public comment. Um, is there anybody who would like to make a public comment on something that's not on the agenda who has not filled out a speaker's card? Okay, we're gonna move on to approval of the minutes from the February 21st, 2019 meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, minutes approved. So we're on to item number five, the brief, Briefing on the BCDC audit report. Um, yeah. So, do we have a member of staff who's going to give us the briefing, or is this? Are we just going to wait till the afternoon? Uh, no, I'll go ahead with the briefing. I'm going to have Brad McRae give a brief intro, and then I will go through uh, the, the substance of the report. OK, great. In my introduction is, is uh, just to tell you what we've been doing this week. As you know, the uh, audit report was released. Um, what, one of the things that we uh, did this week when uh, the, the, the audit was released was to ensure that the, uh, our understanding of the audit was clear and prepare a series of responses that have been posted on our website. Uh, you can find those there. Uh, you can also find the materials on the auditor's website. The staff worked um, not only diligently but very hard over a course of about 48 hours to make sure that we went through it and understood it um, and then prepared the frequently asked questions, uh, a fact sheet, and um, uh, other information that we could get out uh, to the public uh, through the press as needed. So I'm going to leave it there and turn it over to Karen. So I'm going to go through what's in the report. Um, but first, I wanted to start briefly with a little bit of an explanation of what this is. This is a performance audit conducted by the California State Auditor. And I thought it would be helpful to just get a little bit of, of the elements that go into a performance audit of this nature. This is not the type of financial audit that some people are familiar with. It's obviously not the IRS auditing. Um, what, they, what, what the purpose of these is, is to measure performance, assess efficiency and effectiveness, test some key management and administrative controls, and most importantly, offer some insights and solutions for approaches or, or even more significantly, some improvements that the auditor thought that BCDC could make. Um, it, it, really what these are all about is helping us do better and do it more efficiently. So uh, to start um, with uh, the report findings, um, over, over the past couple of months, as Brad has explained, the auditor staff had unrestricted access to BCD's files and its people, and uh, th the ability to talk to anyone, ask questions, get more information. And where we've landed is with this audit report. It makes findings, and mo more importantly, as I just discussed, provides some recommendations. So what are these findings? First off, BCDC has a significant backlog of cases. The report identifies a number of factors that have caused this, including the time staff are taking to try to resolve uh, cases, the lack of staff and resources, and the lack of any formal procedures to establish timelines or milestones to govern case management. 
The report also finds that the Commission needs to develop more formal policies, guidelines, and regulations. Uh, one example here would be that the report notes that neither the McAteer Petrus Act nor BCDC's regulations define what constitutes a single violation. And there's a suggestion that there should be something defining this. Uh, the report also recommends that the, the development of a penalty matrix to detail the weighing of the factors which are set forth in the McAteer Petrus Act. The BCDC's governing statute already addresses the factors that should be considered in setting a penalty, but we don't have a matrix or any policy that discusses how these are weighed. Um, it, the report also finds that the Enforcement Committee and the Commission uh, need to be more active and provide guidance to staff. Now, I want to note one positive he here, um, and that's that this that the report does specifically find that the reconvening of this committee is a positive step, but it notes that this committee should be doing more uh, providing guidance to staff. Uh, next, uh, the report also finds that BCDC needs more enforcement staff and recommends a workforce study to specifically determine that need. The report finds that staff should be conducting regular site visits and doing regular patrols of the areas within BCDC's jurisdiction. Now, there's a reason, incidentally, that this is not occurring, and it points back to the limited amount of staff that we have and uh, the limited resources that those staff have to be out in the field. Uh, one of the things we tried to note for the auditor is that these uh, site visits uh, do occur, and a lot of times reports come in when permitting staff is out in the field. Uh, the report finds staff should not be resolving dredging violations using the standardized fine process, and this is primarily because this is not explicitly spelled out in BCDC's standardized fines regulations. Uh, the report also finds that the prioritization uh, process that was uh, developed recently is not reducing the inefficiencies and is too complex. Now, on, on this point, staff have noted that this is a work in progress. It was very recently developed and it does continue to be worked on. Uh, the report also finds that uh, BCDC's database is lacking information. Now, I'm not going to go into this one in any detail because I think it's better if we provide a um, update in the future for you on the database, its limitations, and then the resources needs that we have to develop better databases within uh, for BCDC. Uh, now, just to do some other findings, uh, there are findings that more needs to be done to protect Sassoon Marsh. As I'll discuss later, we're already working on this. Uh, the state auditor also disagrees with BCDC's use of the Bayfield Cleanup and Invatement Fund for staff salaries. Now, notably here, they do acknowledge that the Department of Finance and legislature have both authorized this, this practice. They simply disagree with it. And finally, I want to end on a good note here. The report finds that BCDC generally drafts reasonable permit conditions that comply with applicable law and that staff meets deadlines for issuing decisions. Overall, really, the report does find that we're performing our job and, and that we perform an important function in, in protecting the Bay. So the major takeaways from this report are that the Commission needs to develop policies and possibly regulatory changes to provide some more direction to staff. And secondly, that without these formal policies, there's a risk, a risk of harm to the Bay and denial of public access as a result of unchecked violations and a risk of inconsistencies. Now, I do want to note a few things, and this is important. Uh, um, first, uh, it, 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 we can't let it pass the infamous tugboat Polaris. Uh, the tugboat is discussed in multiple places in the report um, as an example to support some of the findings. On page two, this beach tugboat, which is, according to the report, decaying in the bay, corroding and deteriorating, is discussed as an example of the things that can happen when staff has no clear guidance to handle cases. On page 23, the report again cites this to support the statement that a lack of clear guidance from the commission creates a risk that staff may make decisions that are not consistent with the law. 
Now, I want to tell the story of the tugboat Polaris and then tell you why I'm telling this story. Um, I'll start with the ending, which is that this is not an example of a mishandled action. It is a case where certain information should have been clearly reflected in the file, and it was not. It's also an example of the things that you see when you ride the train down from Sacramento, um, coming to San Francisco repeatedly. Um, there are, um, what happened here was that this tugboat ran aground on April 14th. Uh, the, US, the U.S. Coast Guard responded. The owner was unwilling to leave the vessel. And uh, several weeks, it, it was reported to BCDC at the time and reported to other agencies. Several weeks later, we opened an enforcement case on this. Um, after weeks of negotiations, uh, the owner not only abandoned the vessel, but I think that they are now, they have now disappeared. Um, and the vessel was cleared of fuel and it was mo moved to a nearby marina. Repair efforts failed and the vehicle did ev eventually sink in its location. Um, Cal Recycle and the Contra Costa Sheriff were working with state lands at the time, and state lands uh, determined that it would exercise its authority to try to remove the vessel. Um, so, uh, during this time, the, the vehicle was, um, was confirmed as cleared of fuel, and in early December, state lands held a public meeting to authorize the removal of this vessel. Uh, with all of this information, uh, BCDC closed the case at the end of December. Now, how do we know this? We know this from doing a Google search of State Lands Commission in Polaris, and it was pretty easy to pull up the public documents that were used in the State Lands Commission's hearing that confirmed the information I've provided. Now, I do acknowledge that this, case, that this information was not reflected, uh, all of this information was not reflected in the file that BCDC had. That file did reflect that, state, that this vehicle is, on state, is within state lands jurisdiction and that there were consultations with the Coast Guard and others um, prior to the closing of this case. What this case represents is not a mishandling, but really uh, the failure to insert certain documents into the paper files that BCDC has. There are approximately 10 other cases that are discussed and used as examples in the report, and I'm not going to go into the details of each of these. Some of these issues have been discussed, but I think the important thing to note here is that the report recognizes for other cases, not just the tugboat Polaris, certain e evidence was lacking in the files um, that, st that the audit staff had um, leading to their conclusions. There is no finding, in other words, that the fine in the case discussed on page 36, for example, was inappropriately assessed. The finding really is that without evidence in the file, it is the, the state auditor staff cannot determine clearly whether it was appropriately assessed. So now on to the recommendations. Uh, the report includes 17 separate recommendations for BCDC, and I will combine some of these in order to get through this quickly. Um, most, most prominently, BCDC does need to create policies, procedures, and or regulations covering a number of areas in order to pro have more transparency and eliminate the risks of inconsistency. BCDC should also update its database and its files and, and simplify the prioritization matrix. Uh, BCDC should conduct a workforce study and seek the resources to hire a compliance position. BCDC should review local agency compliance with the MARSH program. BCDC should evaluate and update its permit fees. And BCDC should appoint a new Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, now, you'll notice I've already checked some of these because it's the principle of when putting together a to-do list, it's always good to, um, to have things on there that you're already doing. We're already moving forward with um, improvements uh, to the MARSH program. And BCDC is, uh, has started um, a, a process on its fees, and as part of this, we will be committing to update the fees regularly as recommended in the report. Now, there are also some, some recommendations in there for the legislature. Uh, most, a lot of these do overlap the recommendations for BCDC. They want the legislature to develop, to, to require us to develop timelines, procedures for management review, and a penalty matrix. Uh, they want the legislature to step in and promote the reporting on our Sassoon Marsh responsibilities. 
uh, the legislature, they recommend that the legislature clarify the use of the Bayfield cleanup and abatement fund and consider fully funding enforcement staff through the general fund, depending on their decision. Um, and then, only after all this is done, they recommend that the legislature provide BCDC with a new tool and an important tool, which is the ability to record notices of violation on title. Um, as you may have seen in our response, we recommend that this does not wait um, several years until we've completed all of the recommendations in the report. This is important and it, and it is a tool that will assist us in resolving our backlog of cases. So now quickly, what is staff doing? Well, we're already working on moving cases. We're working on uh, developing a process to establish essentially a case management plan when something comes in, have milestones and timeframes to move that case along. Uh, we have weekly meetings where we assess the active cases and discuss the new violation reports and really figure out how to move things. Uh, we're review reviewing the best practices of other agencies, as the report suggested, and we are going to use this review to, to move forward with policies and guidance that we will bring to you for your approval. Uh, we're identifying actions, like I said, including policies and changes in regulations. Uh, we're scheduling updates. You will be seeing on your calendar um, ongoing updates to the Enforcement Committee as we move forward. Um, and we also are working on our tools, particularly our database. Now, it is important here, though, to recognize that there are limitations. The database is not lacking simply because we like it to be lacking information. We do not have a modernized, up-to-date database that gives us a full ability to track compliance for permits and uh, the progress of our enforcement cases. We really do need new modern tools and the reason we don't have those is a lack of resources. Uh, I, I've put this slide up simply to, to demonstrate the types of work plans that we have. We're going to be bringing some of these to you so you can see how we are working on resolving some of the issues that were, were described and how we're setting timelines to do it. Um, so I want to go through briefly what's next. Uh, we do have further work to do in the short future. Within 60 days, we do have to respond to the auditor uh, with um, an update on our efforts to implement the recommendations that are within our authority. Uh, this, uh, we're going to have to respond again in six months with an update and then within one year. Now, one thing that should be noted here, particularly with regard to the one-year response, is that several of the procedural changes that they recommend, they recommend that they're done by January 2020. Now, we are obviously going to be working to meet these deadlines. Um, once again, I could, I've already said this, we're going to be doing regular meetings and updates for this committee. And we're going to be working on procedural changes as appropriate and doing this with, through public processes and making sure that we have input from affected stakeholders. So now I'll move on to any questions about the audit. Okay. Commissioner Lodasquez. You know, it's nice to see recommendations, but if there isn't resources behind it, you're going to put the small group of the enforcement committee have to do more work to support the, the more meetings that the enforcement committee has. Again, it gets really back to resources. So unless the legislature is going to provide those resources for us in order to have, a, you know, a, a, a strong team, it looks like there's, you know, five or six people's worth of work there with only three people doing it, and you will fall farther behind trying to comply or proving that you're setting up all these procedures if you don't have the resources. So will the auditors come before the state legislature and help us in advocating for additional resources, or are they simply going to put it in a document and say, that's we've done our job? I know that's more, more like a statement than it is a question. I, I agree with Brad. I think it is the latter. I do, I do not believe that they're going to offer active support for us. Obviously, we can use this audit and, and Really, the way the audit reflects it is they do recommend that we do this workforce study so that we have the, the information that the legislature might expect in order to support these additional positions. Um, one thing that's interesting, though, is that they do, um, without the workforce study, arguably separate from the workforce study, recommend that as soon as possible we move forward with seeking the resources to have a compliance position. Yes. Um, 
I was reading, I got to read it on the ferry again on the way in here, so that was, you know, captive audience. Um, and I, at the end I started reading it, um, once I could get away from some of the colored language that I felt um, just kind of put me on edge a bit, like, really, why do you say that? Um, I thought there were things dealt with that I feel like I am ready to deal with, and I think that's a piece of this, is when we started the Enforcement Committee, we, we didn't understand it. We didn't understand the fines. Um, it was, we were learning on the job. Um, I think the recommendations they made about prioritization and fines that were in a much better place um, as, as a commission uh, board, uh, committee to, to help work on that. Um, and I thought, well, you know, if as a board we had gone out and said, let's hire a consultant to uh, kind of show us the things we ought to be working on, that a lot of this came back with, with with those kinds of things. And so, um, yes, it's more meetings, but I, I really feel like the experiences we've gone through have prepared us, I think, to to more fully participate when we come back to do that. I, I have one question, and I'm not really sure how to phrase this. I'm not sure kind of where the chain of command lies. Um, and this has to do with um, using the abatement fund monies to fund enforcement, and I want to stress it's only enforcement staff salaries. Now, we've done that with, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as I'm con I know, the um, blessing of the legislature and the finance department. So I don't understand why the auditors would say that we need clarification on that point because the legislature and the finance department have already passed on that by saying, yes, you may do this. So it kind of seems to me that the auditors are trying to get in the lane of the legislature. I mean, I, that's kind of the way I read that because I don't know how much clearer the legislature could be absent spending some time and taking a formal vote, but we've already got their blessing to, to do it the way we've been doing it. So I'm trying to understand the pecking order here. Our, our understanding is that the auditor believes that the legislature has approved the front funds in a sort of an, an implied way. They haven't explicitly uh, declared one way or the other. So the recommendation is that the legislature do just that, to explicitly state whether or not the funds are being used appropriately and consistent with the McIntyre Petrus Act. Yeah, and the one thing I'd add to that, and I think this is where you're going on this, is that um, just because the state auditor has made uh, these statements that the fund is not being used appropriately does not mean that the fund is not being used appropriately. The state auditor, as everyone knows, is not really the ultimate determiner of what the law allows. And we have always felt that that provision of the McAteer Petrus Act does allow us to use these funds the way we're using them. Okay, thank you. And I just want to echo um, what my colleagues have said. I think this is going to be a very useful tool for us moving forward. Um, and I know that we're all going to um, embrace the spirit in which this was done. But at the end of the day, if we don't get additional resources, we won't be able to implement many of these recommendations. Um, and I don't know where that will leave us um, other than uh, making a heartfelt plea to the legislature to fund us out of the general fund more fully so that we can have um, not only the personnel that we need, but also the technology. I mean, it's hard to keep track of the thousands of cases that come through the door, you know, over, over the years um, using pen and paper and having the ability to go back and having an, an ability to have a tickler file when things come due um, is gonna be very important to us. Um, I do have a speaker slip on this. Um, so it's John Zucker. So uh, I'm John Zucker, I'm with Friends of West Point Harbor, and 
but what I have to say today is uh, just my own opinion. And um, mainly because, my bad, I didn't know about this meeting until yesterday. <laughs> and I didn't have a chance to run what I had to say by my friends. But I think they would probably agree with most of what I have to say. And I found the state auditor's report to be fairly accurate based on my view. Um, and they had to drill down and, and deep, do a deep drill, you know, and come up with specific recommendations. Because if you're going to make allegations against somebody, you have to have some facts to back it up. And that's what they did. But I was a little disappointed that it focused primarily on the enforcement aspect of BCDC. I know you have, I, th I think my view from, in, from the outside is you have a, a group that does studies, a group that does planning, and then a group that does permits. And the study group studies to see what they think is going to happen. Once you have an idea of the prediction, the planning group comes up with how to deal with it. So you come up with your strategy. And then that's handed off, I presume, to the permit group to create a structure around that strategy so that everyone can be issued permits that take into account what the um, study group predicted was going to happen, okay? <clears throat> and the part I'm talking about is just the permit group within BCDC, not the planning group or the study group. And I was disappointed that in that permit group, the study only focused on uh, the enforcement aspect because I believe that the um, part of BCD's organization that is responsible for permits from the initial application all the way to compliance and sign off needs to be completely separated from the other two groups. And that permit group needs a reinvented business process. So not just the enforcement part, the whole part, everything, the way you do inspections, the quality control, the um, all the points that were made in the state audit, the consistency, and et, et cetera. And I think you need to reinvent your business process and then restructure the organization so that it can enable that business process. And I think you have to uh, revive your core values. And your core values are uh, the part of the company that guide your organization's internal conduct and the, uh, the relationship that you have with the external world. And I know that maybe a decade ago was the last I pretty much saw of anything um, publicly that dealt with the core values of BCDC. So you have core values, but I really think they need to be revived. And I think your business process needs to be overhauled to reflect a uh, customer-centric paradigm in a paradigm of compliance in which enforcement is rarely necessary. And the numbers to me just don't add up. When you have, what, 200 some active enforcement cases, um, that's, to me, that's a very large percentage. And I think when you issue a permit, there's a feeling that, uh, a very good expectation that the permittee has the resources to conform to the requirements of the permit as well as the willingness and the desire to conform and, and that there's no expectation that there will be non-compliance. I mean, that, that's coming out of the gate that you, you expect compliance. And to me, non-compliance should be very rare. And I, I don't know, it, it's statistically improbable that you would have, what, 20, 30, 40% of your active permits be in a state of non-compliance. It tells me something's wrong. And I think once you, you take a look at your business process and you do a serious overhaul about the way things are done, that the organization needs to be restructured to enable that process to happen very smoothly and seamlessly from the time you receive the permit application until the time you finally sign it off. And I, I, I'm hesitant to say this, but I have to say this, that the, you know, some people are good at running a very stable organization and other people are good at, at trailblazing. And I think the, 
that the existing management that got BCDC to where it is today, you know, they did a job. I'm not saying good job, bad job, and none of this is meant as criticism. But I think that the, the management that needs to bring BCDC from today into the future is different than the management that, that uh, you have in place right now. And I intend to be part of the public that demands legislation to ensure that changes in BCDC's management will happen. So I'm going to be on that side of the, uh, the line. <laughs> and it's not nothing personal, Larry. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? No? OK. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak on this item who hasn't turned in a speaker slip? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to uh, close. Before, I, I just, um, one, one of the pages I wanted more just to kind of walk through is page 10 in here that um, shows the commission staff receives a report of violation, assesses the level of harm to the bay, and then it goes to staff level enforcement and also shows it going directly if there's serious harm to formal enforcement. And I'd never, I don't think I've ever experienced something. And it, staff may not be ready. This may be something we put on a future agenda. Commis but Commissioner Teckle, um, can we park that for a second? Because yep. I wanted to close the public hearing and okay. then open it up to commissioner um, discussion. Well, I'll make that motion. Thank you. Do I have Sorry. a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, please continue. I'm sorry. No. Uh, well, I, I'm going to I'm going to let Brad handle a little bit of this, but just to just to let you know, you're you're speaking about Figure Three on page ten, and I believe that the, the intent of this figure, and we did raise a few issues with it, is to describe uh, the two options available, and I would I would call these the options essentially when the amicable process starts to break down. Uh, the report actually criticizes us for the amount of time that we spend trying to work with uh, people to get them in compliance. We, uh, you know, our preference is never to be fining anybody or taking them to a formal hearing. But when that, go, when that starts to break down, we have one of two options depending on the nature of the violation. We do have these very detailed regulations uh, as to how we assess what we call standardized fines. And those are used for the more minor violations and those regulations spell out exactly the types of violations that can be handled through this standardized fine process. And that's what you see on one end of this. Now, the other, the, uh, the other side is the ones that aren't handled through standardized fines and that come to this committee for, um, for a hearing and then, and then ultimately for approval by the commission. So that's what you see this chart representing. I don't think the chart really represents or is intended to represent how quickly those things will move. And as you know, the report does criticize us for not moving things as quickly as we should, but that's what's reflected in this chart. Thank you. Commissioner Vasquez. The work we do is not cookie cutter. I mean, everything is very complex, and every case is complex. You know, the enforcement committee is going to hear an item we heard before and had a recommendation before the entire commission, and the commission chose because the individual had outstanding circumstances as to why they couldn't be there. So to argue that we, you know, we're not that we're taking too much time, I, I would say we're providing a pretty good due process. That, that the person that's, or the individuals or the company that come before us get, get the time in which to prepare. And we get, we have the, as a policy, we've looked to work with everyone before coming to this, this stage of the process. So I don't know, you, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And I know that from my county work as code enforcement, you know, you always want to get the individual to come to, to voluntary compliance or the situation come to somewhat of a voluntary compliance, working with the, working to not to get to this point. And I, th I think it, it's, uh, the audit didn't take that into account. I think the staff has been doing that. And again, it's a small staff that's got to work really hard to get to these points and, and providing that opportunity for people to come in and negotiate. There's nothing wrong with that. 
if I might, one of the things the auditor suggested and ultimately recommended was that we move through the process in a more streamlined fashion. We don't take as long to elevate matters. Uh, we have a long history, uh, for right or wrong, of giving um, alleged violators the benefit of the doubt and working with them to try to bring them into compliance after violations are, are found. Uh, the, the permit staff works very different than the enforcement staff. In the permit world, you have developers that want to get stuff built and they're <laughs> pushing on the staff to move projects forward. In the enforcement realm, it's completely the opposite. The staff is f often following the, the permittee or the violator to bring something to resolution. In some cases, uh, no news is good news from BCDC. If the violator doesn't hear from BCDC, they have no incentive to actually pick up the phone and say, I was just following up on that. So the onus is really on the enforcement staff to, to, to follow. We, so you combine that with this approach to work amicably, and what you have is cases that went on far too long. And we recognize that, and we're going to do better. Uh, we're going to move through process, we're going to give uh, violators notices, we're going to elevate more quickly uh, and use the enforcement committee uh, to bring projects to resolution. I, I just wanted to make uh, a comment probably at the 30,000 foot level. So when the auditors came in, um, they were given access to every nook and cranny at BCDC all the files, they got to talk to staff. I mean, they went through everything. And their report came back the way their report did. Um, they may have focused too much in one area for some people and not enough in another area for other people, but the report is the way it came back based on whatever matrix they ran through to give us the suggestions, um, both for us and the legislature, as to how we can improve how we do business. And as a very wise friend of mine told me once, what is measured is what gets done. So what we have here is an auditor's report with things that got measured. Okay, You may not like what got measured, you may wish something else had gotten measured, but this is what got measured. And I can assure you that BCDC staff and the commission are going to do all that we can to take these recommendations to heart and to streamline our processes, be um, as public friendly as, as we can and, and get this done. But these are the things that were measured and I will say once again, in order to do this, we need resources from the legislature. So, any other comments on this? No, I, th I think we'll have more opportunities. Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Item number six, which is a public hearing and a vote on a recommended enforcement decision and proposed cease and desist, or cease and desist civil penalty order regarding Salt, Salt River Construction Corporation. Okay, now I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Um, uh, you've already had this presentation. Uh, so uh, th th I'm here to talk about the matter involving Salt River Construction Corporation. Uh, they, there are uh, three separate violations that are alleged here, and I apologize, that is my phone. Um, <laughs> uh, Once again, I apologize. Okay, there are three separate violations at issue here. Uh, the first relates to uh, some unauthorized activities involving a barge uh, up in the uh, Richardson's Bay area. Uh, and then two violations, both connected to a dredging operation uh, conducted for Foster City and the improper storage of two barges in Belmont Slough. Uh, the first one was reported to us um, with accompanying video. 
that showed a barge being dragged by its excavator bucket uh, through the bay. The other two came in through a report um, at, at noting that there had been some barges uh, that had been stored in Belmont Slough for an extended period of time after the authorized dredging activities had ended on February 2nd. Um, I have maps and photos that accompanied that report showing the location of the barges. Now, what, we, uh, what staff is proposing is a cease and desist and civil penalty order. It contains a number of elements. Prohibits propelling the barges with using the excavator bucket anywhere in BCDC's jurisdiction except as stated. A prohibition on mooring and storage of equipment in unauthorized locations. Um, uh, the requirement that a grizzly be used on all dredging projects, this is an issue that we um, had identified with some of the dredging operations, um, and a total penalty of $28,500. Uh, $28, that is the maximum penalty for the Richardson's Bay activity, and it is a penalty of $250 uh, a day, somewhere on the low, mid -range, low end. Um, for the unauthorized storage of the barges. Uh, it's, th it's a total of 13,250 based on the number of days involved. Um, now I, I, I believe that the respondent is here and he would like to speak on this matter. Thank you. Mosley with Salt River Construction. Um, yeah, I'd like to address uh, really the uh, uh, the violation for barge storage in Belmont Slough for the Foster City job. Um, you know uh, that the job was never finished, so these barges were not just just stored there after the uh, <clears throat> job was completed until we wanted to move them out of there. <clears throat> they were, the job, you know, the, you know, in the contract documents, the job, uh, you know, was to take three to four, three to four months, you know, a month of setup and, you know, three months to, to do the work. And so, you know, we, we had a plan that we went over with Foster City uh, we were the only bidder. Nobody else bid, um, but we did, and we had a plan, and, and uh, they liked it, and um, they were behind it. And so, you know, we st okay. We started in December because we had to get a late start on the job because the material was being taken to Colin and Ranch, and uh, there was the. Uh, the offloader <coughs> was not, offloading was not available until December. So we spent December moving our offloader and building it and putting it together into uh, calling a ranch. And, um, and then in January, so December was kind of, a, you know, the first month of the job it was at, at, a, at a water work there. Then in January, we did all the, uh, all the dredging in the, in the dredge cut, you know, that went from Belmont Slough to their uh, floodgates that led into the Foster City Lagoon, uh, we had we, we did all the we did all the work, all the in water work we were we were, we were dredging uh, in January, and uh, we got that done, and um, you know our plan the entire time was to build this custom barge. I could go in this cut that was really only 10 feet wide at the bottom, go in on a high tide, get material out, bring it out, and put it into a storage barge, which was parked right adjacent to the dredge cut. And it was the storage barge was parked in Belmont Slough, and we filled up the storage barge. And you know, at some points, it's you know when we had opportunities, 
we would take some of the material out of the storage barge, bring it over the mud flat to the bay, and load it into another barge, and keep doing that process until the, until the barge in the bay was loaded enough to take it up to, all the way up to Vallejo, to Cullinan, to, to pump it out. So, in the month of January, we, we got the dredging done and we filled up these two storage barges and the in-water work was done, but the job was not, you know, that's just the first month of the job. There was two, there was two more months and we had discussed with Foster City it was gonna take three months to get small quantities over the mud flats, you know, small barge loads. We could only take <clears throat> 200 yards at a time and we could only take them when the tide was at 7.4 feet, you know, because <clears throat> to get over the mud flat, the mud flat was a foot, you know, at, at a zero tide, the mud flat had a, had a plus one, you know, it was plus one, it was out of the water. So at 7.4, you know, the tides down there in Foster City are high, they get up to nine and a half, nine and a half feet in some weeks, you know. So, you know, we had to go in, we had to, we had to take this material, you know, so, so at, after, after January, after we were f finished with the dredging, and we had these storage barges loaded with material that had the rest, of the, the rest of the mud in them, you know. Some of that mud was moved across the mud flats in January, but two thirds of it was not, you know, a third of it was moved in January. So in February, you know, we had to take the same barge that, you know, that we built that was shallow draft and could hold a couple hundred yards. And we had to take that material across the mud flat, out into the bay, and load the barge that was going to go to Colonin. We could only do, you know, like I said, we can only do a small amount at a time. But in February, we did have some good tides, and we got that first barge. They're saying, you know, I mean, out of the two storage barges, or, you know, we got that first barge out of there um, within two weeks, or maybe maybe three weeks. Then we had some really bad tides, and uh, but we worked. Uh, you know, we worked every day, Christmas, New Year's, the weekends, what, uh, you know, to try to get this stuff up to calling in all the way until March. Um, and, you know, where the, you're saying that the barges are parked in, you know, in, in uh, Belmont Slough, you know, is a very, you know, it's a, it's a big body of water. It's like a, it's like a, you know, it's like a river. The the uh, I've got some maps of it right here. It's f it's 400 feet wide. Okay. So <clears throat> if you can picture that the dredge area, you know, is 100 feet wide, and there's marsh marsh on both sides of it. Well, right behind it, you know, is Belmont Slough, where we had these barges stored in front of Foster City, in front of uh, you know, Huffman and Broadway, their their uh, environmental consultants. The whole time we had them there to take stockpiled material. They knew that they knew they were there. They could see them there every day. Um, we passed them every day when we went when, when we had to go there. We would go on a high tide to these barges if the tide was high enough to the tide was high enough to get over the mud flat. We would go to the bar. We would take our little dinghy out to the barges unload some of the material into the barge that had to go up and over the mud flat. It was about a mile, a mile or two to the bay. And we would do that on every high tide. And uh, we never just let them sit there, you know. We were trying to get, like I said, we worked through every day until April. We, we you know, we were trying to get this job done. Uh, we never skipped a week, we never skipped any time. We never skipped a day. Um, but so so, you know, these barges were in in the middle of Belmont Slough, and you know Belmont Slough is four hundred feet wide, and this bar these barges are thirty five feet wide. They're not impeding any any kind of fish or anything passing them. You know, there there's always a hundred feet from the barges to the to the levee or the marsh. You know, they're parked you know as close to the dredge site as possible. But out in deep water, so you know they're not near any kind of 
habitat, not in a place where they, they could disrupt, it, disrupt, it, disrupt any habitat. They weren't just stored there. You know, we were working on getting the material out of them and getting the material up to Colin Ranch the entire time. You know, we feel we didn't do anything wrong with these, the use of these barges in Foster City. It took us four months, just like the, like from December, starting, starting in December, just like the contract said, you know. And we, uh, we moved all the material. You know, once we got the first barge out of there in a couple of weeks, we had some ad tides for the, for the second barge. You know, barges were always 100 feet away from the levee. You know, they weren't just parked there. The job was still going on. So, you know, the job was never over. Just the in-water part where you're actually dredging was over in, in, in January. But, you know, February, March, you know, we were not doing any dredging in water. We were just transferring material from the stockpile barges into the barge that had to go across the levee to the other <laughs> bar, st barge that was going to get taken on a 12-hour trip up to Colin and then pumped out. You know. Anyway, we bid the job you know, with these means and methods. I think we tried to show, we tried to explain these means and methods to BCD. So we tried to get them out there to look at you know, how big Belmont Slough is. And that, you know, we're in a body of water. We're not in any, in, you know, a big body of water or a, a big slough, you know. We really had, you know, we'd go in there, work for two hours to load the barge and get it out of there. We never got a complaint, a noise complaint from a neighbor, you know, uh, maybe, maybe till two months after. We didn't disrupt, you know, anything. There was more noise made on, you know. We were surrounded by houses. I mean, we never got a, we never got a complaint. We were never told uh, that we did anything wrong, you know. Foster City knew our exact plan. Huffman and Broadway knew our exact plan. We discussed how we were going to stock stockpile, and we had to stock, you know, we had to stockpile. We had to use the same barge that we used in the cut in the, you know, to, to clear out their cut up to the, to the floodgates that we used to go over the mud flat, you know. Nobody ever told us, said anything, we were doing anything wrong. I don't think they thought that we were doing anything wrong, you know. We worked right in front of the, the, the head of, you know, the, 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 the head of, the, of Public Works lives right there in a the house right there. We worked right in front of him day after day when we came in for that increment of time to load the barges. We worked right in front of the Foster City, you know, public works staff. We worked right in front of their, you know, environmental consultants. They didn't say anything was wrong. We turned in, you know, disposal site records to BCDC, to the water, water, you know, everybody, to the core. So everybody gets our disposal site records. They had to know we were still working. We had to turn in these disposal site records to Foster City to get paid, you know, uh, they, Foster City, you know, they, we, con we were in constant communication with them. They wanted to get the job done. We wanted to get the job done. They, like I said, they never, they, said that, they never said that we did anything wrong. You know, there was nothing damaged. We didn't do any damage to, to the Belmont Slough. We were in deep water. Nothing needed to be fixed. There's, you know, you know, we, I mean, you know, it's like if the, if the environmental consultants saw us out there all the time, if they knew there was something wrong, would they, wouldn't they tell us? I mean, you know, wouldn't Foster City tell us? If we're turning the dump logs into BCDC, the core, you know, wouldn't they tell? You know, wouldn't they know what's going? Wouldn't they know what's going on? Did they? I mean, did did the consultants know? Did Foster City know and not say anything? You know, you know, we don't know. I 
just 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 from the beginning, just from January through March, you know, our, our operations of out there of loading, you know, into the barge that goes over the mud flats to get to it never, it never change. You know, the barge was never moored in any sensitive habitat. We received no warnings or notification. The barges were parked illegally. We were never asked to. We're told to move them from the job site. We're never told it'd be, we'd be subject to, you know, fine. We're never, never, you know, never once did we did we think that we were any doing anything wrong. Okay, um, you've mentioned all of that. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? I'm just looking at my notes, you know, which is just in the middle of. Well, um, can I just ask you a couple of questions? Sure. Um, so based on what you've said so far, it sounds like um, you contracted to do this job. And based on what I think you told us, it sound, sounds like it took longer than you had anticipated to move the material out of uh, the slough. No, <clears throat> you know we thought it was gonna. We told them it was gonna take three months. You know, three months to do the. We, we had three months. The, con the contract says you have three months to do the job, but you can. You know, you can do some. You know, work to set up before that. It took us January, February, March, to to do the job. I thought the barge wasn't moved till April. Am I wrong about that? Contract isn't, you know, yeah. Oh, to help with that, the penalties uh, that we are assessing for the improper storage of the barges run from the um, completion of the of the authorization, which was uh, February. Th they start on February third and run through March twenty seventh. Okay. Um, I, I believe um, Ms. Mr. Mosley has indicated that of, uh, the barges may have been in place longer than that, but uh, that's, that's essentially the period for which we're assessing penalties. Okay, great. And Mr. Mosley, um, it sounds like you're saying, well, so first of all, uh, you were the contractor on this job and you knew this was a permitted um, process. And so wouldn't you, so it sounds like you're saying that um, the other entities who should have informed you of violations didn't do that? Is that what, essentially what you're saying? Like whether it was Foster City or the biological opinion people or whomever. I mean, that's kind of what I thought I heard. I just want to clarify. I don't want to put yeah. words in your mouth. Um, well, they didn't inform us, inform us that we were part that, that our process and where we were parked was incorrect or wrong. Um, whether they knew it was incorrect or wrong, I don't know. I don't know if uh, you know. But but as the contractor and the person who's actually performing the dredging, isn't it part of your responsibility to know what the permit calls for? Uh, yeah, the permit, um, you know, we did the in-water work in January, and then uh, we did the out-of-the-water out work, work uh, you know, we, and we kept working in February and March. You would think that um, environmental consultants hired by the city of Foster City would, you know, would be their responsibility to... Uh, to tell us if, if there's anything, um, you know, and I mean, when do you think there's anything improper? Because we're in we're in open water, and you know, we're we're not, we're not dipping our we're not dred we weren't doing any dredging in the in the water. Okay. Uh, do you have anything else to add? Um, nope. I mean, no. I don't. I mean, I'd, I'd like to answer questions if somebody has some questions. So, what are you asking us to, to do? I mean, it, to wait. Well, what I'm, oh, I'm saying we, we, you know, 
that we didn't we, we believe that we didn't do anything wrong we you know we didn't believe it would, we didn't cause any damage to the habitat or do anything wrong but did you use the backhoe to move the dredge well we had we had a we had we had the tugboat in there going going uh the tugboat had to take the barge so when the tide you know depending on the time of the day the tide got up over 7.4 feet you know we had it we loaded it with we loaded the, the barge that we used to go over the hump with the backhoe but we took the backhoe and we grabbed the material from the that would, from the storage barge you know put it in the barge that, that had to go over the hump and then the tugboat took it over the hump to the no, other I, side I, I'm just okay going so by, no I'm so, just going by no, the two so photos we we no we, did, we just no we used the tugboat but, but the photos make it appear that you used the, the backhoe to propel the barge. So are you saying you didn't? Oh, if I could speak to that quickly. Uh, that's the first violation, mm -hmm. which occurred in a separate location in Richardson's Bay. I know, but it's one that's on yes, part yes. of this. I just want to know. No, we weren't. No, we, you know, we were using the tugboat to move, to move the, bar, the barge, uh, the transfer barge to the... Um, to the uh, barges that stockpile the material. So was the bucket just kind of sitting in the water then? It extended out? No, the, the, uh, so the, the backhoe is on, a, uh, is on a separate barge, you know, which has its own uh, anchoring spuds. And when the backhoe is parked, it's parked on the barge. When it's used, it reaches over to the side, grabs the material from the stockpile barge, and places it into the transfer barge that's going to go over the hump. And then the same thing happens on the other side. And, and then it, it's about storing the barges in an area that wasn't authorized. Uh, is, that, is that what you're saying? That well, we didn't, you weren't told it wasn't authorized, or you didn't know it wasn't. Yeah, we were authorized. never told it wasn't authorized, and we were, and uh, we weren't just storing them there. We were every time that tide hit seven point four feet, we would go out there and transfer the material to a barge that we could get over the hump. It was the only way to do. <laughs> it was the only way to do the job. Um, so sometimes that seven point four tide happened later in the afternoon. Sometimes it happened, or in the, you know, er, early in the morning. The work hours on the job were eight to five. You know, you know, when we were dredging. Um, so, you know, if you only have you know you only have one tide cycle between eight to five, and you got to move. We really move like seven thousand something yards, <coughs> um, even though they only, they only paid us for twelve thousand eight hundred. And, and this is just a separate issue. We get. Um, short at a hundred thousand yeah, dollars on this job. I, I haven't heard anything that you. Did okay, so all right, so 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 uh, we only had an eight from five period from eight to five to you know to move. So in eight to five, there's only one tide cycle that might go up over seven point four. And some days it doesn't even go over seven point four. So if you cut, if you sit down and calculate, you know, how you're going to get this, you know the, this much yardage over the hump in that. In those work hours, it's going to take you three months. So, and that's that's, it, that's it, you know, exactly what they had on the job. So. Commissioner Tuckle, do you have a question? Um, I, I'll wait till after the public comment. Okay. So, I just just a point of clarification, something that Commissioner Vasquez is. So, if I'm understanding this correctly, you have the dredge site you have a barge onto which you place the dredge materials. And then when the tide is right, you have another barge come in and you offload the dredge material onto that other barge and that other barge goes out. Is that basically what's happening? Yeah, let me, let me just try to explain, explain it. It's yeah, you're very close, but let me try to explain it. So, so we, we built a V, a, a channel that was in the shape of a V. It was only 10 feet wide on the bottom. It was narrow. Um, and it came from Belmont Slough, which was 400 feet wide. 
and so we we had to dig this channel that was only 10 feet wide on the bottom, and then it went up went up at four to one slopes and was 100 feet wide on the top, and at the top the top was marsh, actually dry land. So actually it went down five feet, and it went up, we dredged five feet of of ground and marsh, and then below that we dredged five feet of mud. So it was a 10 foot cut. So, so, so in order to, we had to build a special barge to do that. It had to be narrow because of that. We couldn't, we, could, we had to get in there in like three hours and dredge as much as we could and get out of there. If we didn't get out of there, the barge would sit on the cut and destroy the cut. So when the tide came up, we took this barge that we built, had an excavator on the front of it and spuds, and we loaded it, and then we backed out of there and unloaded it into the into the uh, into the, the uh, bigger barge, you know, stockpile barge. Then we went went back in. We get another load. We'd go and get. Sometimes we could do three, and then the tide was done. Then we were done for the day. So. <clears throat> at some at some points, when the tide was looking was was really bad, and we, we figured we couldn't get in there to do to do a uh, to dredge. We actually took some material across the mud, just one load across the mud flat. But when the tide was good, we we went in, loaded, backed out, put it in the stockpile barge, went in, loaded, backed out, put it in the stockpile barge. And so we did that process in January. In Janu okay, so this is what I'm. Okay, I'm so, let me explain. Excuse me, I I don't want to interrupt you, but but my my question is really simple. So basically, what you're calling the stockpile barge was there at the job site, job location for the entire period of your operations once you started the dredging. Yes. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. So I yeah. So I mean, I can explain it better. It goes in, loads the the stockpile barge, and then you know. February, March, or sometimes in January, we take the material out of the stockpile barge and have to take it over to the mud flat, which, which was a, a foot high at you know zero. You could see the mud, uh, so we had to wait till a high tide. Take it over to the mud flat to get to the deep part, water in the bay, and then we put the material in a barge there. Once that barge got filled up, we took it up to Colon and, and pumped the material off. That's how that, that's how we did it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, if I could just speak to this uh, very briefly, there's a couple of things I wanted to note, uh, Just, uh, and this is all reflected in the record in the staff report, which is the authorization that we provided for the operation did end on February 2nd, and that's because of species windows and other things. That was for the dredging operation, which was permitted. And we've looked and we don't, uh, it, is, it, it is not atypical, I have staff here, to, uh, who can help with this, but that it might take a little bit of time after the conclusion of a dredging operation to offload all the material. We recognize that. Uh, we have reviewed the disposal logs uh, that Mr. Mosley mentioned, and one of the things that we note on those disposal logs is with regard to the offloading at Cullinan Ranch, there were uh, three deliveries made, I, and I, I don't have the log in front of me, but they were spaced significantly apart. Uh, the first was three weeks after the end of February, and then there was a, approximately a two-week lag between the next two. Uh, so based on that, we uh, we, we assumed, and, and I, I, I do understand what Mr. Mosley is saying, though, but that these this stored, the barges were essentially stored in Belmont Slough with material on them. We recognize it was the material from the dredging operation, but they remained much longer than we would have expected with an operation of this nature. Um, and then the final thing I just wanted to note is that there is no dispute with regard uh, to, this, to the CDO element that we've asked you um, to implement. I do, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, Mr. Mosley is questioning whether the penalties are appropriate in this case based on the case he, on the information he just gave you, but I do believe that he has acknowledged that absent authorization, um, and there was, to my knowledge, no outreach to explain how this operation was going to work or the need to keep these barges there longer. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, uh, can I, so, sorry, can I say one thing? Um, sure. <clears throat> there can be periods where that tide never gets to uh, 7.4, you know, days and days and days. That's why the unloading up at Coleman was was um, sporadic. And another reason that some of the unloading up at Coleman was sporadic is that we did have a big, large, we would, that fir you know, the first barge that we got out of there early, um, we, we sometimes we use a little barge to 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 fill up that that barge, you know, six loads or whatever, and we would take that up to Colin and unload it. But sometimes we would just take two little barges up to Colin and, and unload them. So they weren't all the same, you know, barges being, un being unloaded. So that's why there's a difference in time on a time schedule. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Mark Schumacher. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm here just as a homeowner in the Tiburon Marin County area. Uh, just to express my concern uh, about the bay and, and how it's uh, managed. Um, I'm here really just to support the efforts by BCDC to hold a uh, saltwater construction company accountable for those ex activities that fall outside of uh, the rules and especially about the storage of barges in such areas. Thank you. Thank you. Melody Schumacher? Morning. We both have cold, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I live with Mark Schumacher and I'm fortunate to live on the bay. Um, unfortunate to be um, have um, next to saltwater dredging, which is in Paradise Cay. We've had multiple and numerous complaints um, about their comings and going and um, parking in our backyard, um, both environmentally and with noise and with um, site pollution and loss of view. And so we're here to support the BCDC in their action against salt water. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last speaker slip I have on this item. Is there anybody else here who would like to speak on this item? Okay, not seeing anybody, I will entertain a motion to close the public discussion. Public Second. hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, uh, committee discussion. Uh, Commissioner Teckel. So just to clarify, um, who did we um, who did we authorize the permit to? Uh, the permit for this operation was was granted to Foster City. And have we heard from Foster City on this issue? Uh, there were discussions with Foster City at the outset of this. Uh, because there was originally, uh, the, the, um, after staff looked at the disposal logs and some of the other information on this operation, there were questions about the dredging operation itself and the amount of material dredged. And there were discussions involving both Salt River and Foster City regarding that issue. Uh, BCDC did, did uh, determine to drop that violation um, with regard to, to Salt River. Uh, it's my understanding that Salt River's position was that Foster City, the permittee, had directed them to conduct the operation in the manner they did, um, and that led to the um, dismissal of that particular violation. But uh, with regard to this issue in particular, BCDC's position is, once again, the authorization that was given to Foster City, which was extended, as, as uh, we do recognize, as Mr. Mosley noted, uh, that there were some complications with this job. He's pointed out various reasons this was a difficult job. Um, there was an extension requested on the authorization, which was granted, but that did conclude on February 2nd, in part because at that point, um, it requires multiple agencies, not just BCDC, in particular the resource agencies. And after February 2nd, they would have been running up against uh, measures that are in place to protect species. So there was no ability to authorize the dredging operation beyond February 2nd, and that's when it concluded, when, when the, authorization, the authorizations did conclude. So 
if uh, we authorized the dredging, the, dr the dredging part was done, the, but the barges were still there, what does having barges there do to species in the bay? Is there a... a uh, well, we had, these barges were uh, either adjacent to or within a sensitive area. Now we, and, and that is a factor that we used in recommending the amount of penalty. Um, in this case, though, as I explained previously, it would not be um, unexpected that perhaps it might take a bit of time after the conclusion of a dredging operation to offload material. This was an extraordinary amount of time. I do understand that Mr. Mosley is now um, s trying to put forth the reasons that this occurred, but you know, quite frankly, the dredging operation ended, our authorization for the dredging operation ended on February 2nd. It was at the end of March that we were notified that these barges remained. Uh, they are they they fit within the definition of fill. They are uh, they are floating structures mm -hmm. moored for an extended period of time, and uh, we went as I said we went back and looked at the logs and tried to review the information and could not really uh, you know essentially we decided to bring this forward be, and and in part with regard to the CDO portion of this we have had complaints in the past about um, unauthorized storage of uh, vessels uh, regarding Salt River. Uh, okay, thank you. Go ahead. So under the contract and the permit, there would have been areas where they were told to bar they could moor the barges? Uh, typically, I, I've reviewed the permits, and I do have staff who could get up and speak to that as well. That is not addressed in a great amount of detail in the permit. It would typically be expected that all of that would occur within the dredge footprint, which is, uh, which is more typical what is authorized in an operation of this nature. Now, Mr. Mosley had indicated that, that uh, Foster City's uh, agreements with him might have addressed the storage of barges, but he hasn't produced those agreements um, or anything to indicate that Foster City either directed him or had some written agreement with him that would have um, covered the storage of these barges in this location for this period of time. So, but what, what we're really looking at is the length of time after a uh, reasonable time had passed in order to have that, those barges moved to the disposal sites. Yes, absolutely. So it, it, it's $250 a day? Yes. So I divided that into, and that's 53 days, so they were there 53 days longer than, than yes, they should have been. Yes, uh, that's, that's from February 3rd through March 27th. And we didn't give any extension then? We were never approached about allowing the barges to remain there for an extended period, and, and we were not aware that they were there for this extended period until we received notice. I believe the first notice came in from somebody who's with the Corps of Engineers on March 27th. So, so whose responsibility would that have been? The, the city to ask for it, knowing that there are contractors out there, or? The city is the permittee, yes. Um, I don't, as to whose responsibility it would have been to ask that the barges remain, um, once again, the barges belong to Salt River. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the people in that industry know that, that, you know, they've got these windows and they need to be done. I mean, is that pretty common? Uh, the authorizations were very explicit okay. as to when the dredging operation needed to con conclude and the reasons why. And it's my understanding that these species restrictions are very well known in the industry. Good, thank you. Okay, any other questions? I guess I, I just, um, we had the first hearing and nobody from Salt River was here. I'd maybe like to hear a little explanation on that and why we weren't notified that we weren't gonna have representation. Can you, can you please come back up and answer that question if indeed you have an answer? Um, yeah, so I think you're, you're asking, you know, are you asking why, um, why you weren't notified that we we're still dredging there? Or are you asking why you weren't notified that there was no, or why there was no presentation at the, the prior meeting? The second one. 
The second one. Okay, yeah. So, um, well, so I was, uh, I was sick and I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't make it. I get, and I, appreciate, I don't think we received a phone call that said that at uh, the time? I don't, so I, was, there no, was there no, nothing received? I mean, uh, I, I did kind of have to, I did get, you know, 2017 we got shorted by Foster City by, for a hundred thousand dollars, and then Greg Mela with Caddy Point Marina shorted us three hundred thousand dollars. I had to pretty much let, lay everybody off, so there's not there's really nobody in the office um, except for me and Kevin, and I was sick, and so I, I couldn't okay. couldn't notify anybody. Anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. And. Uh, I just want to say that uh, um, you know uh, we I've, you know in, I've always been under the understanding that that um, you can still work by moving your barges or you know going to a disposal site you know at, after the windows are closed never been. You know, we we had no, uh, we've never had to notify BCDC or anybody before, you know, that we're uh, doing out of the water out of out of the water work. And like I said, we were in a very wide slough, surrounded by water, not disrupting any uh, okay. any you. habitat. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, are there any other questions for staff? Or are we ready to entertain a motion? Okay, um, can we entertain a motion? I'll move staff's recommendation. And then this goes, it's a recommendation that goes to the full commission, so the individual will have another opportunity to speak to us just as he did to, at the prior meeting. Is that correct? Yes, he will have an opportunity to present at the commission as well. Okay. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, do we need a roll call vote? Yes, I think that would be good. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Commissioner Teckel? Aye. Commissioner Vasquez? Yes. Commissioner Gilmore? Yes. Okay, so uh, motion carries. Thank you. And on to item number seven, report of the Chief of Enforcement. Excuse me, maybe, um, I don't know that there, whether there is an item, but also you didn't approve the minutes, I don't yeah. believe. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Oh, you, yeah, yeah, we did? did. Okay, sorry. Okay, um, so are we having a report from the Chief of Enforcement today? Uh, no, I think we are going to defer that report. Yeah, it's called the audit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, th I think you've had enough of, of, of enforcement activities for right now, so we will defer that report. Okay, thank you. Um, well then, in that case, we are adjourned. Do I need a motion for that? Yeah. Um, uh, come on, Sunny, give me a motion. Oh, so Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.